we're going to start today with uh, Joseph Yonka. Um, I first met Joe at the Augmented Reality event in Santa Clara uh, last year and was just blown away by his integration of uh, augmented reality into real practical use. And uh, we had a conversation after his presentation talking about the integration of um, uh, the integration of augmented reality tied into corporate databases, specifically BIM and PLM, and that led to a number of conversations that have led to this talk. Uh, Joe has some really exciting ideas and impressive visuals, and I hope that you will be as blown away as I was. And uh, with that, please give us a warm welcome for Joe. Firefighting. A Chicago company is developing brand new technology to help firefighters keep you safe. ABC 7's Paul Mikey joins us now with his exclusive report. Paul? Ron and Kathy, you've no doubt seen on football telecast the first down yard marker that appears and disappears. It's a computer generated overlay that's an example of what's called augmented reality. The use of that technology goes far beyond sport. And some Chicago high-tech innovators are now working to apply augmented reality to the future of firefighting. That's like going from zero to 100 miles an hour in a matter of seconds. Time to roll. Never entirely sure what awaits them. There's about a million things going through your mind at the same time. For firefighters like those who fought this inferno in Downers Grove last January, the battle is orchestrated chaos. You and I have been fully engulfed. Lots of talking. You're going to hear lots of noise. You're going to hear lots of yelling. You're going to hear the lieutenant trying to make sure that his, his crew is together. Chaotic moments have always been, but modern day fire science is changing the field of battle. Thermal imaging cameras that can tell where the beast lives and where people may be trapped are now considered vital. In high-rise firefighting, technology can allow on-scene commanders to quickly produce building floor plans, a potential lifesaver. But what if those tools and more were available right inside a firefighter's mask? A heads-up display offers thermal imaging. Another shows what's left in the air path. Another offers structure layout and firefighter position, which can be constantly updated through GPS, in-helmet cameras, and microprocessors. Think of Tony Stark in Iron Man. So it's a 48% power of form, so that chest piece was never designed for sustained flight. Keep close to me. That sort of digital readouts that could provide firemen with really helpful information from all the different data sources they have. A Chicago high-tech innovation company called Tanagram is developing an augmented reality firefighter mask with a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. They're already working on similar technology for the military, and when a firefighter in Arizona said, why not apply your military work to fire science, Tanagram said, okay. What we're doing is we're building a, an information system for firemen that, that unites a lot of disparate tools that they use. It's the ability to superimpose data on top of what you see. The challenge, of course, is providing a stream of valuable, manageable information and not overwhelming a firefighter with bells, whistles, and pictures that distract. It's got to work in a very unfriendly environment, and it's got to be affordable. The possibilities, though, are remarkable. We see the ability to be able to track where the other firefighters are within the buildings. Even though technology is a great thing, we can't get away from the original stuff of knowing what, what's right and wrong with the smoke, you know, how to read the building, knowing what fire's involved. But GPS inside a building and knowing where the firefighters are is fantastic. In the near term, we're going to see it in first responder circumstances where the cost is worth it, where it's going to save lives. And then in the medium term, you're going to see consumers going, I want this stuff too. Fire departments don't have big budgets, so Tanagram is being challenged to build a super mask that will cost around $5,000 a piece. The goal is to have the prototype ready by next May. This is the first look at this new fire technology, and yes, we're entitled to question how well it had worked and how much it had helped in the chaos of a blazing inferno. But touch screens used to be a far out concept. Uh -huh. Look at them now. It well, changes quickly. It does. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Sorry for the uh, introduction and then the weird transition to the video, but uh, I like to use that document to uh, get people oriented, get you the foundational information on augmented reality. I, I, 
Show of hands, how many people here have heard of augmented reality before this? Okay, so we're pretty, that's good. Yeah. It's a lot of noise is being made on, in this area. The uh, challenges that we face, however, have a lot to do with, uh, you know, it's really being used as a toy, as a gimmick, as a, as a marketing piece. So I'm Joseph Junke. It's uh, hard to pronounce and doesn't look anything like it. It's a good German name. And uh, I'm the president and CEO of Tanagram Partners. I'm here today to show you some water. And uh, what I mean is a colleague of mine handed me on my flight out uh, a real thin book by David Foster Wallace. And uh, it was uh, called This is Water. And he starts the book by, say, by telling a parable. In that parable, there are two young fish swimming along in a uh, pool of water, whatnot. And an old wise fish swims by and says, hey guys, how's the water? And they kind of keep going, swimming and swimming. And uh, a little bit later, the young, one of the young fish looks at the other one and says, what's water? And so I, like David, would never say that I am the old fish. I have a long journey to go. But I am blessed with the opportunity of talking about what we call the digital frontier. And I get to say some things today that are, I think, pretty exciting. Um, Ken Short and I were butting heads last night and uh, with the uh, discussion of real-time uh, simulation. And I, I have a thought on that, Ken. I'll get to it when we get there. The, uh, the uh, interesting things that we're uh, kind of going into in this world is it, it's really an opportunity for us to superimpose data that has existed for the last 30 years-ish We've been building two worlds, a virtual world and a, a real world. And, you know, the industrial revolution, all that fun stuff, buildings. But uh, now we're coming to the point where we can actually merge those into one experience. And my approach, our approach, is not really a device-based system. It's a head-mounted display technology. Uh, but I want to take you before that. It might look a little self-indulgent, a little, uh, uh, a little, uh, showing you our work kind of thing, but I wanted to show you, you know, how we got here. So, Tanagram was founded in 1992 as a boutique design firm, and we did amazing stuff. Our first website was in 93, you know, way before the curve, and we led a, a number of organizations through that digital revolution, the media revolution, marketing revolution. One of the uh, things that happened around 2000 was we started to see a mass of graphic designers being pumped out of schools and so did our clients who hired them all and built their own in-house in -house groups and competition became stiff, frankly. So we started looking at ways to differentiate and my passion's always been complex interaction and so it was a natural fit for me. A buddy of mine was a project, project manager at DARPA and he said, boy, we could use some crazy people like you here. Um, yeah. So this is actually one of our first projects. This is a screen we did for a command, an information flow and command and control. What you're looking at is the re-envisionment of the F-35 cockpit display system, not the heads up portion. This is just heads down. And uh, you know, it's just an, it's it's novel. It's not real, but it was an, it was an, it was a fun exercise to understand a hundred-year-old metaphor and convert it into an information display that did some new things. Then we started dancing with Microsoft, and this was in uh, 2008. Bill Gates was giving his last CES presentation, and he wanted a red herring phone because, as we know now, he was actually working on a phone. We, 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 we had a piece of that, maybe, I can't really say. But uh, we had to create a concept, and, and we created this phone called the Window to the World. And, okay, 2008, this is before we were saying I've been around. So, um, we actually uh, designed this, this device and said, it's awesome. I mean, you can, you can hold it up and you can see the world and it superimposes data. And Bill's team said, oh, that's a really stupid idea. And we, and we said, uh, okay, what would you like? And they said, well, why don't you do something in a map display? So we, you know, grudgingly put that one away and did that. And, and then, uh, so you should see here a flexible OLED display folds out, has a whole map interface designed for it. They loved it. There's Bill presenting it at his last CES in his big, fat, purple sweater. Um, the, uh, 
net of that was that Bill actually, at the end of the pre conference, pulled out a phone and, and showed an augmented reality phone um, that was a little bit worse than ours, I think. But uh, we had, stole, we had in, inadvertently stolen his wind, if you will. So uh, fast forward, lots of fun things I can't tell you about working with Microsoft, but it was great. And then uh, they released their IE9. IE9 is special because it's their humble contribution to the world uh, after Hulk the Hole. They're trying to clean up after IE6, you know. So uh, what they do is they actually participate in the World Wide Web Consortium or the W3C and they're pushing forward HTML5 standards. And that's a beautiful thing in itself, except that what they did is they brought the Canvas tag and the SVG tag and pushed those through ratification and then they built their browser to accelerate those tags through GPU. So they came to us and they said, okay, this is an interesting one. We want to, we want them to design a, a website that shows off the capabilities of HTML5, but in addition to that, does some really amazing math. And we were like, ooh, we like that. So we created a site called Sky Beautiful. And what you see here is, uh, it's an animation, it's actually moving, it's moving really slowly. But uh, this is actually a web-based interactive application that's completely, it's, it's completely gestural. What's really special about it is it houses 120,000 star locations that we got from the European, State, U European Space Agency's uh, Hipparcos mission. And uh, doing some simple math, which frankly is devoid of any consideration of space light time continuum issues, we uh, made a 3D model of all the star locations. So again, they're not really there, but you know what I mean. Uh, and then this, device, this, this website's actually showing that star, that star background that you can navigate is showing those stars in real time. It's rendering 120,000 stars in real time and you can pan through this. I invite you to see this site. It's skybeautiful.com. Don't do it on anything but IE9 because it's dog flow. But uh, this is actually a video of the model and I thought this was interesting. We, again, we took their data, ran it through a number of, frankly, Excel spreadsheets, but, um, and came up with the uh, locations. But it's interesting, when you visualize these star locations, first odd thing, we're in the center. No, no, it's not odd, it's obvious, but anyway. Um, the, uh, hearkening to some of our other discussions this morning. The uh, other thing we start to see is some really interesting ring things happening here, which may or may not be you know, part of our sort of galaxy alignment. They could be an they could be a anomaly in the algorithm, but uh, pretty interesting stuff. So they loved it. We had a great time. I got on the keynote video for uh, that opened Mix and opened the IE9 presentation. And uh, we took this to a company, a company you may recognize, Encyclopedia Britannica. And we said, you know, we really love what we're doing, but we want to take it to the iPad. And the iPad didn't have a camera at the time. But we were praying and uh, what we designed, and you're seeing some of the illustrations here specifying, what we designed was a, uh, a device that uses a vision-based system based on the camera to align visually with the stars and recognize their objects. So by pointing it up, yes, I'm going to use the accelerometer, yes, I'm going to use the, the GPS, but I'm also going to use the vision system through the camera to uh, map to the stars grab them as waypoints. And this leads into a bigger discussion. So you're taking this model, this virtual model, and you're, you're sort of bringing it in, into reality. That's the, I mean, there's been star apps out forever you can hold up and, and, and look at the sky. The special thing about this too is it actually connects to the telescope and it'll do that same alignment technology through your iPad, which you can then swipe to control the, the motors on the uh, telescope. So, a much nicer experience if you've ever played with telescopes or, you know, you're not ideal. So that brings us to the promise of augmented reality. I'm going to jump back to this story. I'm going to talk more about the model that we created and what it means. But uh, when we start talking about augmented reality, what the promise for us, the people who would like to profit from it, uh, is uh, Cheap, mobile, flexible, context-aware. Those are all handy. Cheap is, rel is sort of a relative statement right now. Um, but uh, 
the biggest and bestest thing that you're going to get out of this is both the context aware, but really presentation and capture. And so what that's really saying is if I'm using a vision-based technology to align, my, to align my two worlds, what you end up with is a capture device on every head that's using the system. And that brings you more data. And we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to show you the current state of the art. This is kind of a who's who of augmented reality right now. The first thing we saw in the industry was the glyph-based alignment technology where you hold a glyph in front of your laptop with a camera and things grow up around it. They do shoes, they do cereal boxes, they do um, Legos. Thank you, that's the one I was trying to reach to. One of my favorites, yeah, exactly. You can do some fun stuff with it, but you are dependent on the camera seeing that uh, glyph to align. The next big one was uh, more of a mobile, de mobile device augmentation. It's really talking about um, using the accelerometers and, and really not tying as much to the visual input system, but overlaying it. And this is Yelp. They were one of the first players. Um, there are challenges with this. I don't know if anybody's used the uh, Yelp monocle, but if you try to find a restaurant, it might be here, and then a few minutes later it's over here, and sort of drifts over here. That kind of accuracy, well, it didn't please me. I mean, especially when I walked this way, and it was, anyway, the, uh, this is what we, we are doing. And uh, I told you about the grants in the beginning. One of the exciting things about our grants is we basically get to define the answers to the problems. And we conceived this platform called iARM. And iARM is a head-mounted display, augmented reality system. What it does is it, using the technology embedded in the optics for the soldier, the soldier's wearing a glass goggle, it captures uh, with cameras. We actually have five cameras on the rig I'm illustrating here, but uh, we can do it with as few as one. The uh, uh, captures the location and alignment and precise position of that soldier. And we call that asset management, which is really the military's way of saying where are people. So we uh, also use translucent OLED in a really special optic system that I'll tell you about in a second. So that's kind of illustrating where we are and, and sort of what's going on. This is, this is our hardware stack. And uh, you saw the video in the beginning. We were talking about uh, firefighters. I'm I have not officially released the report, so I'm officially not talking about firefighters right now. But uh, we will be releasing it uh, May 15th. The uh, key portion of this slide is that, again, in this environment, we have the opportunity to put some form of surface in a heat-protected place, you know, their face, near their face. And uh, what you're seeing in addition are these lenses. These are contact lenses. And they do some very special things that allow us to align and overlay. And so some of the technology that we'll be using, this is a great video from a, a, a head-mounted camera called the Contour. I don't know if you've seen these. They have a GPS in them. So what you see on this video is me snowboarding down the hill. And uh, you see the uh, path on the right of the map as well as altitude and uh, velocity. Velocity is a good word, um, particularly right about Let's see, right about here. I'm good. So the funny story is, the helmet cam came off. And I got up and skied away. And then spent 15 minutes walking back up the hill to get the camera. But there's another story that's told here while we wait for me to come get the camera. And, and that's the Jeep. No, you know, it's funny. It, they don't. They just leave them. It's really weird. I, I was paralyzed. These are not cheap. I didn't want to lose this thing, uh, but they did not, uh, nobody, I mean, you'll see people like ski right by it. It's like black on white. You can't miss it. It's, I saw it 100 feet away. But what's interesting, too, is look at the GPS uh, marker on the uh, right, and look at how it's sort of really kind of figuring out where it is, and it's clearly not moving, although maybe we are having another earthquake or whatnot. But So it's interesting to me because... Uh, you know, that's where the hardware is today. You know, it's a cheap chip in there. I'm sure there's better chips and the government has better resolution and whatnot, but, you know, not using the optics thing. The things we learned with this camera is that 
first thing, there's no stagger control, what do they call it, sh shake control, so you're going to get sick if you watch this for too long. And uh, the second thing, so it also, that also presents us challenges as far as uh, alignment, but then the second thing is, of course, the hardware for the GPS. The next piece of technology is the scale invariant feature transform. And what this is really doing is it's taking the picture. You're, see, you're seeing two screens here. And I think it's going to play. Maybe it's already played. Sorry, guys. Hold on a sec. I'll give us something more to look at now. Okay, so what you're seeing is a real-time capture of what we call key points. And key points are objects the camera sees that the computer can reference from any scale, any lighting condition, etc. So you see certain things like his eyes are, lock are dead locked on. This is not a face recognition technology. It's just that the camera has picked that shape as a, as a marker, a key point, and it's using it in real time to capture. So you know there's two pictures here. The one on the uh, Right-hand side is actually a still we grab while we're doing it, just so we can kind of keep, you know, do analysis looking at those features. But the key thing is we're doing this in real time, and, and that's that's tricky. And especially if you're using hardware like this, you know, it does a little bit of it's a little processor intensive. So okay, so now I can, now I have the ability to see key points, and I have the ability to mark them, store them, recall them. But what gets really interesting, and AutoCAD's got a product that, that does this now, but uh, this was done a, a while ago. Um, anyway, the, uh, what we're doing is we're taking still photography and we're, we're mashing it into a point cloud cluster. And you're seeing my house rendered with 40 pictures, uh, which isn't that great these days. They do it in a lot less. But, uh, and somewhere around 100 million points, which is a lot of data, frankly. But that is an Uber model, and that actually does not reside on our hardware. That resides on the server where we, we capture larger larger systems and ship up our, our uh, delivery system actually ships up lighter weight packages that are compared in real time and used for alignment. So that allows us the scaffolding for what I call pristine registration. We have the ability now to register the, the virtual world relatively accurately. You're going to see me go in here on the zoom and you'll see the points in better resolution. Now, after that, you start to have to talk about interaction. And I don't really want to carry a, a keyboard around with me when I'm using my new augmented reality set. So obviously, gesture is a big deal. I'm actually showing Sky Beautiful here in a touch surface as an illustration. It's a little bit less relevant because it's a touch surface. But um, the fact that we can capture movement, capture hands, be able to show things as they move through this environment um, and even recognize, well, we, we call them glyphs, but they're actually like hand signals, like this or this or, well, I'm not going to do that one, but you got what I mean. Um, those shapes can be recognized by the computer and acted upon. So the technology, this is, uh, we like to call this the blue laser. It's always two years out, um, but it's, uh, you're seeing uh, translucent OLED. Uh, once again, Samsung brought it to uh, uh, CES this year, so we're pretty sure it's, it'll be here soon. Uh, we've also done a ton of experiments with L LCD screens, uh, which obviously have different refresh issues and uh, need a different lighting system, but uh, are wonderfully clear if you tear them apart. We've been tearing apart photo frames. Get a really nice LCD screen. Anyway, and then this is the magic behind the magic. This is a contact developed by a company called Innovega. It's been FDA approved for testing, and they're going through the program right now of getting it market tested and available to consumers. And what it does is some pretty special things. It has a series of very, very small metal pieces. Uh, they're really like RFID chips in them. And they give us passive eye tracking. So you move your eye. We know it because our sensor sees the RFID, RFID chips move. In addition to that, it allows you to see, to see two focal planes. You can see something that's a half inch from your face, like a pair of glasses, and anything else you're looking at. So with that magic, we can bring you head-mounted augmented reality before the 
the rest of the people, I think, who have been struggling with just a single pair of glasses that use lenses and lasers. And uh, My favorite is the one where they bounce lasers off my retina. Yeah, you can do that to me. So uh, there's a lot of exciting technology that, out there. There are some limitations right now. We do have to worry about some schedules, but they're lining up. We think we're going to have FDA market approval for the lenses in the next uh, end of next year. So this is a, a quick tour of some of the capabilities of augmented reality through the presentation I gave at ARE and our iARM platform. This platform was designed for military foot soldiers and uh, as a collaboration platform. I think collaboration is probably a, a dirty word. Um, Chris Walker was telling me not to use the word collaboration anymore. Anyway, I'm learning all sorts of things today through this trip. So we, we, did, we did the announcement, and as Brad said, it was picked up and, and got a lot of attention. New York Times and Gizmodo said that we were going to create the Terminator. Um, and just so you know, we actually are the build the shields kind of guy, not the build the bullets kind of guy. There are people out there that do the bullets. We just like the shield part. Um, back to this guy. So some of the things I didn't talk about. You've probably played around with a voice recognition system and been as frustrated as I have in using that to control your word processor or whatever. But what we do at Tanagram is we look at the lowest, the lowest ability, the lowest possible useful situation. And single word stuff works pretty good. If I yell, you know, stop, it'll, it'll pick that up relatively accurately. It runs into it when I say, please stop the computer and do this activity now. It, it has a hard time with that. But so voice recognition is a big piece of our, of our control system, as well as what I told you, the gesture control. And again, this is a vision-based system, so we have camera input for that. The uh, processing unit likely going to be something, oh, you know, I'm actually forgetting. <laughs> no, it's not going to be an iPad. It's holding up the iPad. It's too big. It doesn't fit. Um, the, uh, the technology that Apple's rolling out, a lot of people in Japan are using it right now. It's the one where you can near-field Bluetooth sync. There's likely we're going to be going in that direction as well. Uh, we also have the ability, we also, in that lens, the camera set, we had ultraviolet and uh, infrared uh, capable cameras, so they were off visual access, and I'll show you more about that in a second. So I need to give you a quick narrative of this, uh, this uh, slide metaphor. You're seeing two pictures right here, clearly. On the left-hand side, you're seeing what the world sees bunch of soldiers standing in a circle. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing a 3D model of the terrain, the mission, and even the risks in that mission that have been documented in previous missions. And what's really exciting about this is the 3D model that you all see from different perspectives. So as you go around it, everybody's seeing the same model, but they can enjoy the different perspectives and really enjoy it in a context that is a little bit more physical feeling. This is a technique that we call station presentation. And what that means is it sticks to the ground. It stays where it's put. It doesn't float or persist or bobble in your face. And then when you're in the field, because we have that really, really, really accurate position of every soldier wearing the gear, we could paint them blue like Halo. And yes, we did steal from the video game world. We stole lots. Um, you know, popping their call signs, you, you can see here we've got the map display running. You're looking through the goggles clearly. Up in the sky, questionable whether or not that's a safe thing if air forces are being used. But um, we do try to keep things off of buildings and out of, you know, small enough so they're not going to block a sniper, for instance. Um, we sometimes present on the ground if it's not an area where we're worried about IEDs. But uh, it's really powerful if you see somebody who's glowing blue. And in the military, blue is friendly, so don't shoot the blue guy. Um, this is an example of gesture control. This is actually, what I've done here is, well, what the user has done here, is they've taken their fingers and made that little photo frame square shape, stretched it out, and that's the command to draw a control interface. And in this particular paradigm, we use maps, and they have the ability to lock that to one of their hands and really allow them to... Uh, you know, navigate through buildings and see things that they weren't able to see before. They can, they can, it'll stay on their hand until they shake it off. How about that for a metaphor for control, right? We also have the get the fuck out of the way command. So that, that means clear my screen because you're bugging me, right? So how many times have you wanted that command? 
So this is an interesting hybrid. We have the ability to draw on the world. And what you're seeing here is because this is a, a MOAN, a Millions of Eyes network, they've stationed a member of their team up on a rooftop so he can see from different perspectives and they can have a more refined view of what the soldiers, or, or what they're encountering. And he sees these funny tarp things behind the wall and he's decided to say, hey guys, you probably want to steer clear of those. So as he paints that with his finger, the guys are seeing that painted in real time on that wall from their perspective point. This is a good example of, uh, hey, you probably don't want to be standing around here anymore. And so there's a couple of cool messages going on here. One is um, those red windows are highlighted because they have, they, they have a, a sniper targeted there. And apparently he has more than a rifle. He has something that shoots bigger bullets that explode. And the crosshairs is actually are indicating a tank has been targeted to that building. So you don't want to be standing under it right now. Again, all, all for the soldiers and nobody else to view. This is a, 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 a command center, we call them a cop, uh, or part of the, actually the display is a cop, it's a common operational picture. But what's exciting about this is in addition to using a surface display technology, we're using our headsets to present video inputs from the different soldiers. And in this case, we're doing a hurt locker kind of thing where the woman's shouting with a cell phone and they don't know if she's good or bad. And so she's being highlighted with a, we don't know, and they, they're piping this uh, information to a linguist who knows the regional dialect, which they've been trying to teach our soldiers for a long time, but you know, I'm 42 years here and I still don't know English, so you know, I'm good luck with that. The, uh, what this is actually showing is that we're creating a world that becomes our own document. And these highlighted windows are aged descriptions of where bad guys have been peeking out in the past. So, Soldier Squeaky here is uh, going into a domain where he knows, hey, you know, if people have been there before, I'm going to keep an extra eye out there to make sure they don't go shooting bullets at me. And that kind of walks through some of the metaphors we're dealing with. And I've got 40 more slides than that. If you guys want to see them, I'd be happy to. I don't have time today. Uh, but uh, let's talk about head-mounted display augmented reality. This is a video from some recent work. Uh, showing our deck star hand, single hand control for firefighters. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, men who like yellow coats. And what you're seeing here is a radio broadcast coming over, and uh, it's a real simple system. Um, it's a way to communicate very quickly with different people. And, and in this case, you're actually seeing that soldier viewing another, so I'm sorry, soldier, uh, man with yellow coat, looking at another man with yellow coat's view where he's find, found a burning thing. And uh, he's dealing with that, kind of walking through that, and you feel assured that now you've found the source of whatever problem could be happening. The, uh, again, big. Uh, the next piece is obviously contamination detection. And one of the things that I really want to highlight about this particular domain is what I've shown you is just, it's, it's attached to a hand. But we embed data, and I have a longer video, it's about 15 minutes long, that shows the entire application. But uh, it embeds data in the entire environment. And firefighters, I mean, sorry, and yellow coats, uh, often walk into rooms with lots of uh, particulates in the air and uh, very few lights, so often see nothing. And this is a real opportunity for us to use our system in cohorts with a BIM modeling system to provide the outlines of the walls, locations of gas mains, hazardous chemicals, um, really a lot of the value filtered down. I mean, this is insane. There's so much here. And this is a fraction of what this model probably contains. By the way, I got this model off of Google. So I have no idea what I'm talking about. Just, just did a search. Oh, that was pretty. Um, so room layout, hazardous substances, and, and like I said, uh, dealing with the, the environmental cues, as well as flight paths, egress paths. So right now, men with yellow coats have to walk into a building following a hose in the dark. And if they drop that hose, they're screwed. They have to bend down and try to find it amongst all the other crap that's probably down there. And then they have to follow that back out. Well, we actually can paint that path in real time as they track through our system. So they can follow their own breadcrumb trail, or they can go to an emergency elk acid. What you're seeing here is a series of illustrations that I'm going to say are blatantly ignorant. 
And um, so I'm saying that because these are ideas. You guys are the smart guys. We're the dreamers. And we're just saying there's a lot of really cool potential out here. So using our lens technology, using our uh, augmented head mount display system, you're seeing a couple of contractors or engineers looking at the construction of a building and noting the uh, height restrictions. So I'm from Chicago and there are places where you actually can't build a skyscraper in front of somebody's house because they get mad and you know, stuff like that. So that's important in our world. Um, but sewers, gas, any kind of data that you would really be using in that particular evaluation. And this is really talking about just the presentation of information into reality, right? It's lightweight, it's just lines, a little bit of text. This is one of my favorites. Although, frankly, it's really, really wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure that we don't, people don't weld airplanes anymore, but still pretty cool. Um, we're showing two things here. One, I imagine this is a big, maybe Boeing type of hangar where you see the time, I don't know if you guys have seen the time lapse building of a 767, which is awesome, Google it. The, uh, um, but we've, we've actually placed the model in this environment and we're building around the model. The model is actually sort of a blueprint of what we're building the plane. So there are physical elements in here, as well as the pieces that haven't been added on. And frankly, you know, it's a pretty big hangar if it can have the wings and the whatever. But again, it's an illustration. Uh, and then the other thing we're showing here is guided. Uh, it's really focusing more on sort of PLM data systems. And, and what you're seeing here is a really, really archaic show of uh, weld points or weld, what are they, weld mounts. Uh, anyway, instructions on for the for the welder to actually, uh, you know, hook the pieces together. But imagine that being anything. It could be bolts. It could be you know, put this door here. Uh, check and and because it's relatively accurate, we can do things like checking tolerances. Although let me caveat that and say that it's not the really really small tolerance. This is an example of, in addition to pre presenting this, um, perhaps you have a wind farm that generates a quadrillion gigawatts of power and you now dominate the world. And you need to control down one of the units because it's malfunctioning. Well, instead of getting your laptop out, dialing into the system and or, you know, whatnot, you, you might even have an iPad app, I don't know. This guy just does a gesture, has the command for that particular piece because the gesture was at that piece, that uh, windmill, and he, now he's got a control unit panel that he can toggle it down and do some statistical analysis. So it's embedded control. So then things start to get interesting. And this is where I get pretty excited, specifically because I tell this to my clients. My dad told it to me when I was a kid. He said, son, if you have money, it ought to be making money. And I, was, I didn't have any idea what that meant. Still don't. But uh, what it means, I think, is that uh, if you've got money, then it should be generating more money through interest or investments or whatnot. Similarly, data, I tell my clients, Whoever, at the end of the game, whoever has the data wins. The data is the thing that's valuable these days. And so building data systems that actually grow themselves is a really interesting concept to me. And I call it living data, but I'm sure it's got a billion names that are probably more appropriate. But uh, this is an example of a ER, I'm sorry, uh, uh, an operatory. And inside the sterile field, there are people out there doing digital information systems in the sterile field, but they're computer monitors and they're always in the way, and this is all you can just swipe it out of your way in your face. But you're seeing an overlay of some form of scanning and uh, giving him an idea of, you know, I probably don't want to hit that iliac artery. And I'm, oh, here's the incision path. What, what's special about this incision path is that guy's actually not the surgeon, it's the guy in the window, the, chief, the guy who's in charge. He's actually watching through his lenses, his cameras. And, in, and indicating where to go and whatnot. So really going to happen? We are talking about it. We're talking about remote medical assistance. In addition, the ability to bring up media, like an endoscopic exploration on the spot, is pretty valuable. I mean, we, we see it now. We know it's, it's a good thing. So he's got an endos endoscopic video sitting up there that's cued to play so you can understand. He's got the heart rate associated with the heart, et cetera. I'm waiting for you guys to just land based me after I get done here. All right, so then uh, this one is uh, this one's the one that curls Ken's toes. And uh, the reason is because what I'm showing is an on-site forensic analysis. 
So this is a hydraulic unit that's failed, failed miserably. And uh, I don't know if they fail that way, but it looks like it's failed. So um, what they got is based on what they're seeing in comparison against a whole bunch of other similar situations and perhaps a semi-real-time uh, structural analysis, we can determine maybe the sort of forces that cause the damage um, and, and do some diagnosing right there. You know, maybe Billy Bob drove the dump truck into a ditch or something. I don't know. This one's pretty cool. Uh, this is a real Ford Mustang, but we're superimposing the wireframes of the Mustang, and then those wireframes are actually generated from mechanic views of consumer modifications to those cars. So in this particular example, they're looking at spoilers. And you can see that the models that they can sort of carousel through on the display show those show the different sort of spoilers that people have attached. There's a couple cool things here. This is really just touching on it, and that is in user-centered design, we learn more by looking, out, looking at how people bastardize our product than actually you know, trying to figure out how to make it right. And what I mean is, um, Don Norman tells a story about uh, doing this medical cart that he designed. And uh, he went around and did all his research and built this really wonderful cart, deployed it, and then through happenstance, happened to run across that cart in the field. And noticed that they had taken a coat hanger and built this little antenna that holds the cords for the system out of the way. And, and he, was, he said, oh, that's interesting. And then he started to see more and more of them. And now you've got, you know, a little user-centered study going on. And there's a hack. And he incorporated that into the design. And it went through the life cycle. The uh, thing that's happening here in this picture as well that uh, might curl a few people's toes is uh, we are doing a, a aerodynamic analysis sort of in real time. And uh, ah, I know where he is now. And uh, uh, this is an opportunity for us to come back to our consumers. And I used to have a TT. You, know, you guys know the, the Audi TT when it first came out, really beautiful. Um, they had to put these really ugly fins on the back of it because if you went over a certain speed, the whole thing would just float off the ground. Right? It was like a giant wing. And you know, there's an impact to changing those sort of aerodynamics. It may be, maybe not life-threatening, but how cool would it be to come back to a customer and say, you know, that seven-foot wing you put on there is probably going to make your car a little dangerous to drive. So it's a real opportunity to kind of close that loop, I think. And this is another neat one. Um, how many people are familiar with the Nike Plus program? Nike, OK. Anyway, you run around, you have a, your iPod on your arm, and it tracks your path, your speed, your all sorts of exciting things. It's relatively low fi but it's really cool. Um, but it also uploads its data into a big system that's part of their ecology. It's a little portal site. But what if they were to offer a, a deal for John McNabb that after his shoes wore out to send them back to him for a, a Benny uh, discount on something, you know? So they get his shoes back after he's run with them for their lifetime. And what you're seeing here is a st structural analysis of the wear points on the shoe compared to the profile, which John McNabb matches at 98.2 percent with 128 or 120 other results of similar wear, and now you can start to look at the performance of your application. And okay, I'm waiting for the land basing on this one, but you know, really, what we're looking at is the ability to take that data back into the system and refine our product. So, the end game here is really how do we embed this data? How do we have something that's really exciting that can actually make business run smoother versus, uh, you know, I like to talk a little bit about email. It doesn't make our lives any easier. If anything, uh, we spend more time pumping through menus and, than we ever did, and it's sort of ridiculous. Good technology should be invisible. It should assist you when you need assistance and otherwise get the hell out of the way. And that's really what we're looking to build. We're on a program. Uh, several of our grants are, fingers crossed, going uh, phase two. So we're actually going to have the hardware in place here shortly and be able to show a whole bunch of exciting things very soon. So I set this up so that we could have some time to ask, ask questions and, and lambaste me. And uh, that's now. Thank you. So who? 
I've stunned you all. Oh, I see a hand. Uh, I have. Uh, I'm Rajiv from 3D Systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Just one question is, all the data that you can show through the headset and whatnot, do you think predominantly it's going to dominate through 3D data or 2D data? Because most of the things you can do 2D2 and 3D2, and in your view, what are the trends you see? Is, is 3D data going to capture most of these applications or is it 2D data? So that's a great question, both. Or how about yes? The, uh, the answer is it really depends on the need. We have, I, I didn't really go into it super deeply, but I talked about the, the, the station, the concept where things stick in the world. We have a couple other, uh, a couple other concepts. There's persistent view. In other words, if you turn this way, it's always there. It's like the oxygen gauge for the guys with the yellow coats. And um, you have the ability using gesture to move those, maybe not that particular object, but you would have the ability to move those to different locations, including, the in-between station and persistent view, which is sort of an orbiting view. So I could position data here and not really see it unless I looked right there. So there's sort of that piece there. So that, that opens up, okay, so is it a 2D screen? We've been trained pretty well. We know 2D. Um, so every time somebody says, I've got this brand new interface, the first thing I wonder is, okay, is it going to have windows, icons, mice, and pointers, which is the WIMPs acronym, um, because that's what we know. So some of it's going to show up that way, but if we can embed it, one of the apps that I want to build, I've got parts of it, but not all of it, that I want to build is a graffiti app that lets me paint on walls. I want to make a giant octopus hanging from the, what used to be called the Sears Tower. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's just an artistic expression, but it could be dimensional. It could be just embedded on the side of the building. Um, what I get really excited about is using the augmented platform to model. Because to me, your hands are something you're born with. And, you know, you've been trained for a while on how to use them. And, and, and so, if you have the opportunity to manipulate something in a physical space, it may not be physical and you may not be able to touch it, but it sure is a hell of a lot closer than looking at, you know, a flat screen that's a, a trace of an object in sort of 3D to your eye and then you're controlling from a mouse over here that has to go around, you know what I'm saying? It's, I mean, how have we lived with this? I don't know. But yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Oh, you might have to wait for a mic. Sorry. I was a little confused about your discussion of the house, you said you took 40 pictures of your house and you create a 3D model. Do you envision that there could be a technology that would allow us to do 3D capture of things that are built in the world without having to scan it with a laser and take a million points? Can you do that with photographs? Yes, yes. It's actually out there now. You can hit on the Google. Um, a gentleman or a team just showed an app I can't recall if it's an iPhone app, but they've just shown an app that takes pictures and converts them relatively fast into a 3D model. They show a car that they model with four pictures, which is astounding. Um, when we got into this, it took a week and a half to do a model, and we figured out how to get together a whole lot faster. Uh, we're using, by the way, just to give props we're due, the University of Washington has a uh, system that we started. We found it's a point cloud generation system. It's also the parent of the uh, um, Microsoft 3D product. Like, yeah, thank you, Photosynth. So yeah, um, that's where you start. The math was really, really crunchy, and we did some sneaky things to make it faster, and, and it's gotten it to, to perform a lot faster. But these guys actually just jumped past us, and that's how it works. So we get to now stand on their shoulders. Joe, uh, can you talk for a little bit about the uh, we've been able to do many of the things in the past in 2D monitors, the, the visual display. Can you talk about the impact that actually being able to walk around a car as opposed to look at it and rotate it uh, has and, and the qualitative nature of the difference? So, thank you, yeah, absolutely. You know, our, our mind is magical things. We take abstractions and we, we make sense out of them and that's sort of our dream here. Um, 
but if we can have a physical thing that's traced with digital or ref uh, referenced with digital, now you've got the tactile feedback. And most importantly, you start to look at collaborative discussion. So I've got a, a, one of my guys who went to engineering school, and there's a joke there. I'm not going to tell it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but he was telling me about how there used to be, you know, you'd, you'd take your huge ass prints of your model and you'd throw them on a table and everybody'd stand around. I know you don't do that now. But the idea of looking at, you know, abstraction and sort of an upside down abstraction, you know, that's, that's work for your brain. That's cognitive load. And frankly, it kind of opens the doors for misinterpretation to some extent. But if I can hold something or in, in real size, or perhaps even a, a thousand times bigger, a hundred times bigger. I've got to watch my logarithmic stuff now after a uh, presentation earlier, Chuck's presentation. The, uh, um, you know, the ability for me to stand here and look at this and somebody else is looking at it from this side and really enjoying the whole physicality. It's an illusion, but it's physicality. It, it's, our brains get it. This is natural user interface. And if you haven't heard of NUI, natural user interface is Everything you were born with and no other sort of abstractions, that's kind of the pristine goal. I don't know if we're going to get quite there, but you get it. I'm waiting for somebody to come up with an AR menu, menu system. It's going to kill me. Um, but anyway, yeah, the opportunity to be, really be able to touch these things. And what if you could modify those touches? You know, you've got 3D printers that do some pretty amazing things, but they're getting faster and cheaper. I've got a MakerBot. It's about $1,000. It prints 40 centimeter by 40 centimeter plastic objects like basically a hot glue gun uh, that's on a, you know, PLC, sort of. But, uh, you know, we're, lo we're looking at the generation where the physical things can be made faster and faster, and what if we get to a point where I can mount something on this print and it can modify it as I modify it, and, oh, wow, I'm making things in real time like play. Does that answer it? We have, we have time for one more question. All right. You two in the ring, whoever wins gets the question. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, we're going to sneak two in, so ask, quick, ask fast and I'll talk. <laughs> you have to walk fast. Uh, several years ago, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I'm sure you heard of the cave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Daniel Benz, I saw, was able to uh, experience that in Ulm, Germany. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they were designing the interior of the Airbus. Mm -hmm. And you can touch walk in a cave, touch everything, change the colors, textures, and so forth. Yeah. So this is this type of reality or this type of application is now enhanced more because of speed of the platform or what's the, the, the experience is more enhanced, the fidelity of the experience is more enhanced. The mobility or? of the experience. You don't need a billion dollar cave to do it. So that's really the strength of, of this. You know, Again, we're shooting to build these units at about five grand as starters, but they'll come down. Um, you know, they'll have limited functionality at that price, I mean, clearly. But yeah, I mean, that's significantly less than a case. Yeah. Grab in the mic real quick. Yeah, shoot. No, you. So I've got a real quick question. Excellent. I rolled off drawings for a flight, for flight hardware at NASA two days ago. Cool. It's a proximity question. Mm -hmm. I did sensor integration, so I'm familiar with a lot of the problems that you're working with. When you fell on your snowboard, the integration error. Yeah, yeah. So, how on those sensors? So, I mean, I'm I'm looking. You've got you've got the glyphs. You've got the the, the camera. You've got the solid modeling. Mm -hmm. We we can play sneaky things with the math to trick the geometry. Mike's got an awesome piece of software that can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So the sensors. Uh -huh. And you your break your your fractured cylinder and the tolerances. Yeah. And between volume and latency, that's all processing things. So I can even excuse the processing issue. Uh oh, so you're almost getting to a land base. Okay, I like. Yeah. <laughs> How far are we on the sensors? And oh. because that 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 to get a real overlay, you got to be there and you got to be there now. Yeah. And so my question really is, I want a design like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. I really I want it. I want the Iron Man. Hands. Who wants to do it that way? <laughs> Yay! How far are we on the sensors? Uh, we're pretty close. So I'm going to say pretty because they're, they're, we're, we're finding the right balance of key point capture versus alignment. So what's beautiful about a key, so again, the sensors, he's saying sensors, I'm saying cameras. The sensors. 
Um, the cameras right now, first thing we're cheating because we have two. We, we get instant math on that, right? I mean, it's like a, a free gimme. The second thing is, um, we can do it with one, by the way, but two is even better, faster. Um, what we're looking at is the key point, the count on the key point. So I can get billions of key points, but it takes me a little bit of time, a little bit more time to get them for alignment. Um, the system actually does some pretty nice interpolation. Um, I'm not happy with drift right now, but we're getting close. So it, it, it's exciting, I would say, timeline-wise. I'll give you a couple timelines, but the timeline for the, uh, the system to be designed is about a year. We're about a year out to have everything where I feel like it's ready to start testing and you know, playing with. The contact lenses will be uh, FDA certified or FDA approved for consumers uh, end of next year. So that sinks in. And we're testing on uh, displays that are kind of winky right now. They're sort of ugly and hacked. And you thought the View 6 glasses were gross. You've got to see what we play with. Um, but uh, that translucent OLED is, is the mystery piece. So you've got to get the manufacturers to kind of jump in there until somebody actually figures out what else you can use it for aside from this platform. You know, we're, we're waiting on that one. And the, higher, the resolution of that is important as well because at this range of 640 by 480 pixels, like about the size of a softball. So you, you do need some resolution there. And that's really the biggest piece we're waiting on. And my guess is I'm you know, throwing out the blue laser disqualifier probably two years for that. You know, thank God Apple's got the uh, high resolution displays now. Joe, thank you. Thank you. Have another round of thank applause. You.